I want to thank you, and I want to thank you now for the welcome that you're going to give our eighth president, Dr. Lily McNair Roberts. Dr. McNair, this is your school. and I'm quite humbled and honored. 
honored to be here in this role, but I want you to understand who I am and how I got here. Then say a little bit about the present status of the university, and then talk about my vision for the future and the ways in which we can work together and partner to live out this dream, to live out this paradise. So, I'm going to start at the beginning. There's always been a question when people say to me, where did you grow up and where are you from? I'm going to answer that question now. I was born in Georgia. I'm a Georgia peach. <laughs> was a 
fractional distillation of petroleum. I submitted it to the Westinghouse Science Fair, and I got honors for that. So I did not get Then I started working in the Counseling Center at Vassar College. 
And then I realized I missed teaching, and I missed doing research, and I really wanted to get back into a faculty position, and the position became open at SUNY Mutual Falls. So that's where I went. I was there for a couple of years, and we had our two children while we were there. George was also teaching at SUNY Mutual Falls. We had a wonderful time collaborating. Uh, we developed, we, we formed a group for black men and black women together. He had a group for black men, I had a group for black women, and we were kind of like the young couple, the young couple on college. That was kind of fun 30 some years ago. <laughs> it, it is as we look back at the, at the evolution of our relationship. But then we moved to the University of Georgia in 1992. Now, George is a graduate of Morehouse College. I'm very, very proud of his Morehouse College. <laughs> and George always wanted to come back to Atlanta. George is from Miami. He always wanted to come back to Atlanta. And I said, okay, I think I can handle going back to Atlanta. And I got a job at the University of Georgia. And he got his position at the Centers for Disease Control. So I look back at those years with a mixed emotions and awe, because I don't know how we did it. I do not know how we managed to do this. Now, I think the hardest part of any relationship when you are a couple and have, is when you have young children and each of you is working in the house or outside of the house. And that was the case for, for us. George was traveling a lot for CDC. He did a lot of work with HIV and minority health. I was working at UGA trying to get tenure. That, but for me, that was a big deal. So we lived in Stone Mountain, Georgia. He drove west. Oh, OK, those of you from Stone Mountain. <laughs> go to work at CBC and while our children were in private school in Atlanta, he took them to their private schools and I drove east 60 miles one way to the University of Georgia. It was against traffic so it wasn't bad at all. But this is what you had to do. This is what you had to do. And I did that. And we did that together. And the only way we survived is I know I have a wonderfully supportive husband. So I want to thank you publicly again for your support of our family and what I've done over the years because it couldn't have happened without you. So through all of this, I did become, I did get tenure and I was the first African woman American woman to get tenure in psychology at the University of Georgia. You won't believe it, but it was 1999 when this happened. <laughs> yes, it was 1999. And I remember I, I had several doctoral students whom I trained, the majority of whom are women of color. And when this happened, we kind of all celebrated together and said, wow, you did it, Lily. Can you believe it's 1999? But we did it. Sometimes change takes a while, but you cannot give up. You cannot give up. You have to keep that wheel to the stone. So during this time in my career, I really saw myself as a faculty member. I had not had an administrative experience besides being Associate Director of Clinical um, Studies at UGA. And I plan to stay at UGA. You know that time in your career when you say, this is the best job I have and I'll be here. This will be the last job ever and I'm going to retire from this job. <laughs> That's what I said at the University of Georgia until I got a call from Spelman College. <laughs> and when Spelman called and said, we have this position here, we'd like you to consider it. And I went to visit Spelman. Oh my God, I was blown away. I was blown away. Now mind you, during this time, my experiences with HBCUs were through my times with George. We would go to Atlanta regularly while we lived in New York to homecoming and Founders Day and so forth. So I absolutely appreciated what happens at HBCUs. Now I want you to know when I was applying to colleges, my parents told me, 
They were very protective. We lived in the North, and said, we don't want you going any place south of Washington, D.C. So I did not apply to any school south of Washington, D.C. Now, sidebar, when I came back to UGA, my father still said, why are you going back south? <laughs> my father's from Charlotte, my and my, he grew up at a time when things were really, really difficult, very, very difficult for black people in the south. And he said, why are you going back south? My mother said, there are good opportunities there. Things have changed. He goes, why are you going back south? <laughs> My father is very, very happy about me coming to Tuskegee University. Mr. Stafford said he's a smart man. He did not say, why are you going to Tuskegee? He said, this is wonderful. I am so proud of you. So, I love my time at Stillman. I loved being part of an institution that Beverly Daniel Tatum has said was a place that was built for me. And that's how I feel about HBCUs in general. These institutions are built for us. They're high expectations, they're high levels of accountability, and you know that the faculty there, the people who are, who are working there, they believe in you and they want you to succeed. You do not have to go there and wonder, do they think that I'm going to fail out before it's a No, they want everybody to succeed. <laughs> so during my time at Spelman, I worked with others to enhance the academic and research experiences for students and faculty. It was a wonderfully collaborative experience. I work with people in the sciences, as well as in the humanities and the arts. But in the sciences, I had wonderful experiences making alliances with people at NSF, NIH, with agencies in the government, and so forth. So we really learned how to develop opportunities for students around scholarships, around research partnerships, and so forth. And all of these opportunities prepared me for being a provost at Wagner College. So I was at Wagner College for seven years. And I worked hard there. My first order of business was to build strong relationships with faculty and students so that they felt listened to. And they felt that I understood where they were coming from. And then we worked on, on coming up with and revising the general education requirements which had not been revised in almost 20 years. So we worked hard on that. It took three years to finally bring it together, and it was passed by the faculty unanimously. I worked very hard with department chairs and students on a diversity and inclusion initiative, and also developed an initiative around social media and pedagogy. I worked with the president around fundraising, and brought in money for faculty development and research in civic engagement. And through all of this, I became much more attuned to the various constituents that a president must touch and work closely with in order to advance an institution. Working with trustees, working with alums, community partners, students, faculty, and staff, as well as elected officials. While I was at Wayne, working with African American alums was very important. Okay, so let's take a minute here. We're talking about a predominantly white institution where during the 70s and 80s there were not, there was a sense of uh, difficulty for African American students around the status of the university. Very few African American professors, very few courses around African American history and experiences in the curriculum, and so forth. So the giving level for African American alums who graduated in that period was very, very low. So I knew it was important for me to come in and really work with and reach out to and develop relationships with African American alums. 
And that's what I did. George and I hosted receptions at our home to bring alums in, and then we brought in students, because the alums wanted to meet students and understand what's happening here, and what are the wonderful good things that are happening, what are the opportunities, what are the successes, and what do we need to work on. Since that time, we have seen that African American alums are more involved with the college, have served on the alumni board, and the giving rate has gone up. So that's important, an important strategy with all alums. However, I don't think I need to do that kind of work here, given all of, all of your presence here. But I just want to give you an idea of some of the experiences that I have. second year students. So we're losing 30% of students between the first and second year. For part-time students, that rate is even lower. So it's going to be very important for us, and you'll see this in my goals, for us to address the first year retention rate. I would like those retention rates to go up over several years because it takes a while to increase these retention rates. But if we can get to 85, 86, 87 percent in the next five years or so, I think that would be tremendous for Tuskegee University. And those are the kinds of markers that people look at in terms of the rankings. So in terms of HBC rankings and U.S. News and World Report, we're in pretty good shape. We're at number 10 in terms of HBC rankings and U.S. News and World Report. We're at about 30 percent. 37 in terms of regional universities. But we've got to move up because we are a brilliant diamond. We've got to move up. Maybe go to the next slide, please. Revenue and expenses. I know that this, is, this print is very small, but this is going to be from our annual report. And if you're interested in getting a copy of our annual report, you, you can call our office of communications because the report is in press right now. But what I want you to see is that in terms of total fiscal year 17 revenue, our revenue is $123 million. But in terms of expenses, $117 million. As Chairman Page says, we are doing very well in coming out with surpluses every year, which is very notable given that this is a time when many colleges and universities are facing budget shortfalls because of difficulty in bringing in students and bringing in enrollment. But I wanted you to have a sense of what our revenue is and what the expenses are. We're very stable, we're moving forward, and my job working with you all is to increase the revenues that come in. The next slide, please. Thank you. These are total gifts and commitments and trends over the last four years. And you'll see for 2017, $8.5 million that are brought in, total gifts, and so on. We want to increase that. We want to work very closely with alumni groups, with corporate partners, with federal agencies, with research grants, and so forth to increase those gifts and commitments. Because an investment in Tuskegee University is an investment in our future. May we go to the next slide, please? Alumni giving trends. Look at the important contributions that you as alumni are making to the giving every year. And in the last year, 2017, your giving accounted for 44% of that $8 million. And I want to give all of you <laughs> I want to give all of you a hand because you work tirelessly demonstrating your love for 
called Tuskegee University. Now, there is a little bit of work to do because the alumni giving rate is about 10%. But we can increase that.
I, I won't forget that day, I think it was over 95 degrees, <laughs> Mr. Rupp. And I said to Mr. Rupp, are we going to walk over there? Because maybe we can get a golf cart. <laughs> Remember, 
the vision of our founder and the important visions that is, that is necessary for us to rise in our ranking. So I look forward to questions from you and getting to know you as we talk about my vision for Tuskegee University and your thoughts about the future of Tuskegee. Thank you very much.